Want to speak real Hebrew from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at HebrewPod101.com. Hi, everybody. Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what does the particle E mean in Hebrew? E is a prefix symbolizing negation. It comes from the word en, literally meaning there is no. When this prefix is joined with certain words, the compound means the opposite of the original word. As you may know, nouns in Hebrew have gender. So if you add a prefix to it, how do you know what gender it is? Trick question. Actually, the prefix doesn't affect the gender of the word it precedes. Let's look at some examples. The word havana means understanding. So, e havana is misunderstanding, like in this sentence. Ani mitnatzelet, zoyta e havana. I apologize, it was a misunderstanding. The noun understanding, havana, is a feminine noun. When adding e to it, the gender doesn't change. This is why we use the feminine form of it was, zo haita. Next, we have the word justice, which in Hebrew is tzedek. So, when we combine it with the prefix e, it becomes e tzedek. Injustice, like in this sentence. Medinyut ha-memshala yotzeret e tzedek chavrati. The government's policy is creating social injustice. The noun justice, tzedek, is masculine and wasn't changed by the prefix e. This is why the adjective social, chivrati, takes the masculine form. Our last tip is about the plural form. Once again, the prefix has no influence on the gender of the word. The word will take its plural form, if it has one, and the prefix will stay where it is. For example, let's look at the compound from the beginning of this lesson. Misunderstanding. Understanding is havana, so Misunderstanding will be e havana. The plural form of understanding is havanot. So the plural form of misunderstanding is e havanot. How was it? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Leitrot! Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is... Why is it that in Hebrew, some adjectives are different when they refer to people than when they refer to objects? This issue involves adjectives in their feminine form, mostly adjectives for nationality like American or Russian. The difference is in the ending of the adjectives. It can either be with it or with ya. For example, a Russian woman would be isha rusia, but a Russian boat will be so why does this happen? First of all, it's important to know that both forms of these adjectives are commonly used, but in different contexts. Usually the ending ya, like in Russia, Russian woman, is used to refer to a woman, while the ending it, like in Russit, Russian boat, is used to describe places or objects, such as a restaurant, a shirt, or the Russian language. Grammatically speaking, both forms are acceptable. The foundation of Hebrew grammar is the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, in which we find both of those forms used for all purposes. In the Tanakh, the feminine ending, ya, describes women, but also objects or places, like in the word nukhriya, meaning foreign. Some examples with this word would be anukhi nukhriya, I am foreign, and be'eretz nukhriya, in a foreign country. Besides the ending ya, yeah, there is the ending it, also used in the Tanakh for both people and objects. For example, Isha Mitzrit, Egyptian woman. Dlat Mitzrit, Egyptian pumpkin. We can even find both endings for the same definition. Ruth Moavia, Ruth the Moabite, Ruth from the kingdom of Moab. Shimrit Moavit. Shimrit, the Moabite, Shimrit from the kingdom of Moab. However, as I said earlier, in today's Hebrew, there is usually a difference between the two forms. This rule doesn't apply only to nationalities, but to other adjectives as well. 
Let's look at some examples. Ishadatia, religious woman. Shkunadatit, religious neighborhood. Ishachufshia, free woman. Snichachufshit, free falling, which more naturally translates as skydiving. Since this is not a set rule, but rather a differentiation, used in more common language, sometimes the ending it is used for a woman too, like in these examples. Secular woman, chilonit. Iranian woman, iranit. Israeli woman, israelit. Confused? Well, there are some good news. Regardless of the singular form, the plural form will always stay the same, yot. For example, Let's look at some adjectives that are used when referring to a woman. As you may know, the adjective has to agree with the noun in both gender and number. Rusiot, Russian. Datiot, religious. Khofshiot, free. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Leitot! Hi everybody, Deet here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher. Well, I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what is the construct state smichut and what are its rules? The smichut construct is very confusing since it can alter the forms of words and change all kinds of grammatical rules. Let's try to make it clearer. So what is smichut anyway? Basically, it's a way of expressing of in Hebrew and it consists of two words side by side that create a noun. Let's go through some examples so you can learn how to use smichut correctly. Let's look at a simple example, the compound water bottle. A water bottle is a bottle of water. In this compound, the main noun is the second word, the bottle. And the first word describes the noun. In Hebrew, it will be pretty much the same, except that the first word will be the main noun and the second will be the description. So, in Hebrew, water bottle will be bakbuk maim. Bakbuk meaning bottle, and maim meaning water. Some compounds combine two nouns to create a completely different noun. For example, the word weather in Hebrew is the compound mezeg avir. The word mezeg means temper, and avir means air. So literally, this compound means air temper. In some cases, the singular form of a compound can include a plural noun, for example, the compound dog trainer in Hebrew will be me'alef klavim. The word for trainer, me'alef, will be singular, but the word for dog, kelev, will take the plural form, klavim. This is to indicate that the trainer trains more than one specific dog. In the same way, a window cleaner will be menake chalonot and not menake chalon. So far, it's not so bad, right? Well, now it's starting to get complicated. If the main noun is feminine, singular, and ends with the letter he, then the he becomes tough. Like in this example of the compound cheesecake, uga plus gvina, ugat gvina. Another issue is the plural form of these compounds. Like in English, when multiplying the compound, only one of the nouns takes the plural form, the main one. Therefore, if we want to say cheesecakes, we will not say ugot gvinot, but rather, ugot gvina. If the main noun is masculine and plural, the plural masculine ending, im, becomes a. Notice that the nikud appears on the letter just before the yud. We'll use our first example again. If we want to say water bottles, the plural form of bakbuk, bakbukim, will turn into bakbuke, like so. Bakbukim plus mine. Bakbuke main. Another rule the smichot is altering is the prefix ha, which means the. As you may know, when turning an indefinite noun into definite, we add the prefix ha to the noun itself and also to the adjective it has. For example, the big bottle will be habakbuk hagadol. However, in smichot compounds, only the describing noun gets the prefix ha, like so, bakbuk hamaim the water bottle. Lastly, there is one more issue, perhaps the most confusing one. Sometimes the vowels of the first noun change, like in these examples. Cheder plus ochel. Chada ochel, dining room. Bait plus kele, 
Beit Kele, jailhouse. Most Hebrew speakers don't know the complicated rules for this unique construct. They simply learned how to use it when acquiring the language growing up. For Hebrew learners, it's definitely harder to learn these exceptions. But the more Hebrew you hear and speak, the more natural it will become. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Later! Want to get cheat sheets, audiobooks, lessons, apps, and much more every month for free? Just click the link in the description to get your free language gifts of the month. Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what are some common Hebrew idioms? Every language has its everyday idioms. In English, for example, we have idioms like, what's up, or it's raining cats and dogs. In this lesson, you learn some everyday Hebrew idioms. The first one is, lidchof et af. It literally means pushing or shoving one's nose. As you can probably guess, it means to meddle in other people's business. The next one is la sot sipur. It literally means to make a story, and it's used like the idiom to make a big deal in English. For example, alta sem is a sipur. Don't make a big deal out of it. The next idiom has to do with superstition. Riftoch pel satan. It literally means to open one's mouth to the devil. It originated from the Jewish prohibition against saying bad things about yourself or other people. Today, however, it's used in a similar way to the expression don't tempt fate. Don't say good things because you might jinx your luck. For example, אני חושבת שאני אעבור את המבחן, אבל אני לא רוצה לפתוח פה לשטן. I think I'll pass the exam, but I don't want to tempt fate. Our last idiom represents a life philosophy. Bali. It literally means, comes to me. But it means something like, I want, with a whimsical edge to it. A lot like the expression, I feel like. It was considered a children's idiom, but quickly became common among people of all ages. You can use it with nouns like, Bali pizza, I feel like eating pizza. Or with verbs like, Lo bali la lecht la voda. I don't feel like going to work. Note that this is a slightly cheeky expression, so you shouldn't use it in formal situations or with people you don't really know. It can come off as rude. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. They thought. Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what are the differences between all the adverbs that mean really and very in Hebrew? There are a few adverbs that can mean very or really, and this can be somewhat confusing. In this lesson, we'll review some of the most common ones to clear things up. The most basic one, which is the most accurate equivalent of very, is me'od. Like any other adverb in Hebrew, me'od should come after the adjective it refers to. However, due to the influence of English and other languages, in colloquial use, it can appear before the adjective. It's very simple. For example, let's look at the two ways to say a very big house, using the word me'od. Bait gadol me'od. Bait me'od gadol. Our next word is mamash. The adverb mamash means really, truly, or very. For example, really good could be mamash tov. In colloquial speech, it can also precede the word no to mean absolutely not, or no way. Mamashlo. The next adverb is bemet. It literally means in truth and is used to make sure something is true or real. For example, is it really you in the picture? Would be ze bemet atabatmuna. Unlike any of the previous words in this lesson, this word can also stand alone. You can ask bemet when you hear something surprising like there's a bear in the kitchen. Bemet? Our next adjective is a lot like the word most, beyoter. The adverb beyoter comes after the adjective. When it comes after a definite adverb, it means the most, like in the biggest house, habayt hagadol beyoter. When it comes after a verb or an indefinite adverb, it means quite, very much, like in a very big house. Bait gadol beyoter. The next word is the colloquial version of beyoter. Hachi. 
This adverb means the most and will always come before the adjective, like so. Hachi gadol, the biggest. Hachi chacham, the smartest. Our last word is one you may have heard before, nora. This word can be either an adjective meaning terrible or an adverb meaning terribly that can be used together with negative or positive adjectives. Like me'od, it can appear either before or after the adjective, like this. Nora ta'im, terribly tasty. Mafrid nora, terribly scary. Adverbs can make your sentence much more expressive, so try and use them. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Hey thought. Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what are the meanings of some of Hebrew's unique greetings? Hebrew has special greetings for different occasions. Let's take a closer look at some of them. We'll start with the very useful greeting, which means good luck. Behatzlacha. It literally means with success, as if to say, may you complete your task with success. You can say to a person to wish them good luck with a test, a job interview, a new project, or any other goal they wish to achieve. For example, if your friend got promoted and you want to wish him or her good luck with their new job, you can say, or simply, The next expression can be heard around dinner tables, in pubs, and at parties. It means cheers and it's used as a toast when drinking with company. The literal meaning of lechaim is to life, reminding us that life itself should always be celebrated. Lechaim. This next expression can come in handy when celebrating a happy occasion such as a wedding, engagement, childbirth, graduation, and so on. When someone congratulates you, you can answer bekarovetz lecha, literally meaning soon so shall it be by you. For example, if you just got engaged to your girlfriend and a single friend congratulates you, you can reply with Toda, bekarovetz lecha. To a female friend, you will say bekarovetz lech. The last expression is a famous one. You may know it since it came from Yiddish and was adopted by English as well. You may know it as Mazal Tov, and in Hebrew it's Mazal Tov. It literally means good luck, but is used as congratulations. This expression was originally meant to declare that a good thing had happened. It was said at weddings and births as if to say, what a lucky event has happened. With time, the meaning was altered a little, and today this expression is used to wish a person luck in the future. You can use it whenever you want to congratulate someone, on a new job, winning an award, graduating from university, and so on. For example, Mazal tov leyoma uledet, literally, congratulations for your birthday. Or, Mazal tov congratulations on winning the first place. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Hey, Trot! Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, why is it that counting nouns in Hebrew, the counted noun is sometimes referred to as singular, even if there's more than one? You may have heard the common Hebrew birthday greeting, Ad me'ave srim shana, meaning, may you live to be 120, or literally, until 120 years. If you have, you probably wondered why the word for year, shana, is in its singular form and not its plural form, shanim. The reason for this is a rule regarding Hebrew counting. When counting a noun in Hebrew, if you have more than 10 of the same item, you can refer to the items as singular or as plural. It's your choice. 10 items or fewer will always be plural. For example, 50 shekels could be either 50 shekelim or 50 shekel. And 75 people could either be 75 anashim or 75 ish. But nine years can only be Tesha Shanim, and 5% can only be Hamisha Achuzim. However, despite this rule, 
Using the singular form for accounting is common only with nouns that are counted frequently, like money, units of time such as hours, days and years, or percents. It's unlikely to hear someone say, יש עשרים ציפור על העץ. It's like saying there are 20 birds on the tree. If you're unsure, you can just use the plural form with numbers except one. It will always be appropriate. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Later out! Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher where I answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, how can I tell what the plural forms of Hebrew nouns are? In order to understand plural nouns, you'll need to learn how nouns in Hebrew work first. All nouns are either masculine or feminine, and their gender depends on the last letter of the Hebrew word. Sounds confusing? Don't worry, we'll break it down in this lesson. Most feminine nouns end in the letters taf, t, or he, h, while most masculine nouns end in any other letter. The plural form of the nouns is just as easy to remember. The basic rule is that feminine nouns change the last letter to the letters vav taf, ot, while masculine nouns get an extra yod mem at the end, in. Let's do some examples so you can learn how to make plural nouns correctly in Hebrew. First, let's take the word lamp, which in Hebrew is menorah. Lamp ends in he, so it's feminine. To make a feminine noun plural, we simply remove the he and add Vav taf, ot, and get the word menorot, meaning lamps. Let's do another example with a masculine noun. The word for bag in Hebrew is tik. Tik is a masculine noun, so we just add yud mem, im, at the end, and we get tikim, meaning bags. So far, so good. But of course, there are some exceptions. Some nouns get the opposite gender ending in the plural form. For example, the word ant in Hebrew is nemala. It ends in he, and like most of the nouns that end in this letter, it's a feminine noun. However, in the plural form, it takes on the masculine ending, so it sounds like this, nemalim, meaning ants. Another example is the word table, which in Hebrew is shulchan. Here, it's the opposite. Table is a masculine noun, but in the plural form, it takes the feminine ending making the word shulchanot, tables. Unfortunately, there is no rule to help you figure out which are the exceptions to the rule. Hebrew learners just have to memorize them. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Later out. Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what does the Hebrew expression Rosh Katan mean? The expression Rosh Katan literally means small head and is used to describe a person who only does the bare minimum or doesn't think outside the box. It's mostly a negative expression, but you can also use it to describe yourself, like this. Anima difliot Rosh Katan. Literally, I prefer to be a small head. The opposite expression is Rosh Gadol meaning big head. This describes a person who makes an effort to go above and beyond what is expected of him. It's a positive attribute and is often seen in job advertisements as something companies are looking for in a candidate. This expression can also appear in a different form as a verb. Lagdil rosh, to make one's head larger or to expand one's head. You can use this expression if you want to say that a certain person is very responsible and will go out of their way to think outside the box and find creative solutions. Here are a few examples. Anati menahelet metsuyenet. Hitamid magdila rosh. Literally, Anati is an excellent manager. She always expands her head. Here is another example. Itai, im ata otsa litkadem bachavra, ata chayav laatkhi lagdil rosh. Literally, Itai, if you want to rise in the company racks, you have to start expanding your head. Do you know any other Hebrew idioms? Tell us in the comments. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Hey, Trot! 
Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, are there dialects in Hebrew? Modern Israeli Hebrew has no geographical dialects, but there are some features of the language that change between different social or ethnic groups, expressed mainly in the pronunciation of guttural consonants. Hebrew was a frozen language for 17 centuries. It was used mostly for liturgical purposes and was not a spoken language. Towards the end of the 19th century started a process called the revival of the Hebrew language. It took place in Europe and Palestine and changed the usage of Hebrew from a sacred language to a spoken one, the one used for daily life in Israel. In the beginning of this process, there were mainly three groups of Hebrew regional accents, Ashkenazi, spoken by Jews from Eastern Europe, Sephardi, spoken by Jews from Spain, Brazil, Portugal, and Italy, and Mizrahi, spoken by Jews from the Middle East. As the process went on, features of the different kind of pronunciation merged, and today's spoken Hebrew has two main varieties, Oriental and non-Oriental, that differ mainly in the pronunciation of the consonants Ein, Chet, and Reish. In short, an Israeli whose parents came from Yemen sounds a little different than an Israeli whose parents came from Russia. But in further generations, the accent normalizes to more standard modern Hebrew accent. How was it? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Later out. Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, Well, I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, which are the most common Hebrew greetings? Like any other language, Hebrew has many greetings that native speakers use all the time. In this lesson, we'll learn some of the most common ones. The first one is Titchadesh. The expression Titchadesh is said to someone who just bought or got something new. It can be anything from a haircut to a new house. This expression comes from the word Chadash, meaning new. And its literal translation is something like, you shall be renewed. There is no natural translation in English. If you want to say the same expression to a woman, you'll say Titchadshi. If you want to use it to greet more than one person, you'll use the plural form Titchadshu. The next expression is Kol HaKavod. Kol HaKavod literally means all the respect. You can say it to someone in order to show your appreciation for an achievement they've made, big or small. It means something like well done or way to go. Unlike Titchadesh, this expression doesn't change according to the person you're speaking to. An example would be, Your Hebrew is very good, way to go. The next expression is very useful. It's said a few times every day, Beteavon. Beteavon literally means with appetite and is the Hebrew equivalent of the French bon appetit. You'll hear it from waiters in restaurants and from hosts presenting a dish. And you can use it when eating with other people right before taking the first bite. If you happen to sneeze around Hebrew speakers, you'll hear the next expression, la briout. La briout literally means to health. It's the Hebrew version of the English bless you and the Yiddish zum gesund. You can use it whenever somebody sneezes. Try using these expressions whenever you can. It will make your Hebrew sound more natural. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Later. Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, is it true that Hebrew was a dead language for centuries? Actually, Hebrew was never dead. It just ceased to be a spoken language. But let's start from the beginning. Historically, Hebrew is regarded as the language of the Israelites and their ancestors and was a spoken language in the kingdoms of Israel and Judah from about 1200 BCE. Hebrew had ceased to be an everyday spoken language somewhere between 200 and 400 CE, declining since the Bar Kokhva revolt. However, it survived into the medieval period as the language of Jewish liturgy, rabbinic literature, and poetry. Since the Bible is written in Hebrew, all the Jewish people around the world could read and understand it. In the 18th century, the Jewish community in Jerusalem was composed of Sephardic Jews who spoke Ladino or Arabic and Ashkenazi Jews who spoke Yiddish. In order to communicate, they needed a common language, so they created the early version of spoken Hebrew. 
However, it still wasn't a native language, but a basic way to communicate. The literary Hebrew was renewed in Europe starting from the 18th century by a Jewish movement that decided Hebrew was deserving of fine literature. Hebrew writers of the time wanted to write essays, poems, and novels, and to translate European literature and science books. However, they realized it's very hard to write about contemporary topics in a language that has been frozen in time, so they had to find a way to update the language's vocabulary. Thus, biblical language was combined with figures of speech and vocabulary from the rabbinic literature, together with vocabulary and syntax found in European languages and Semitic languages such as Arabic and Aramaic. Another important contribution to the Hebrew language was made in the 12th and 13th centuries by a Jewish family of rabbis who translated Jewish writing from Arabic to Hebrew. The Arabic language, which belongs to the same language family as Hebrew, made an important contribution to the revival of the language. In the 19th century, Hebrew writers began arriving in Palestine, influencing the development of spoken Hebrew. Hebrew schools were built and Hebrew was used in public activities and eventually became the language used by the Jewish population in Israel. This process was aided by many organizations that saw Hebrew as an ideological purpose. Today, the spoken Hebrew in Israel is called Israeli Hebrew or modern Hebrew. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. They thought. Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher where I answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what does the word Nora mean and how should it be used? The word Nora has gone through some interesting changes over the years. It appears in the Bible meaning awesome or awe-inspiring in reference to God. You can say it in this sentence from the book of Deuteronomy, Ha'el ha'gadol ha'gibor ve'hanora, which means the great and mighty and awesome God. In modern day Hebrew, the meaning of the word nora has lost its positive aspects and become more about the fear inducing aspects, become an adjective meaning terrible or awful, like in these examples. Ha'seret ha'ya the movie was awful, or in this one, it was a horrible experience. The word nora also appears in the expression lo nora, meaning something like it's okay or it's not a big deal. Let's look at this example. Say you're with your roommate and you're on your way home. When you check your bag, you realize you forgot your keys. Your roommate could say, Shachachta et amuftechot? Lo nora, yesh li muftech. You forgot the keys? It's okay, I have a key. The word nora can also be used as an adverb meaning very or terribly. It can be added to negative adjectives, but also to positive adjectives like nora yafa, terribly beautiful, or nora manyen, very interesting. It can appear either before or after the adjective. One important thing to note is that this use of the word nora is colloquial and shouldn't be used in formal situations. So next time you're with your Israeli friends, try using the word nora with one of the many expressions we've learned in this lesson and see how you sound. How is this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Later on. Want to get cheat sheets, audiobooks, lessons, apps, and much more every month for free? Just click the link in the description to get your free language gifts of the month. Hi everyone, my name is Yara and today we're going to do uh, top Hebrew phrases. These are very useful phrases you're going to hear a lot when you come to Israel, so uh, make sure to memorize them. Okay, let's start. Shalom. Hello. Shalom literally means peace, but we use it also as a greeting. Shalom. Manishma. How are you? Uh, that's a very casual way of asking how are you, and it literally means what is heard. Like, yeah, like what have you been up to, what's going on with you. Manishma. Toda. Thanks. And probably the only way to say it, we don't have like thanks or thank you, it's just toda. Bevakasha. Please. Bevakasha, it means please, but it can also mean there you go. So you can say, Efshar lekabel maim, bevakasha. Can I have water, please? And when you give someone water, you can also say, Bevakasha, there you go. Slicha, excuse me. Uh, it means excuse me or sorry. 
So when you like push through people in the bus, you can go, oh, slicha, slicha, slicha. Uh, but when you step on someone on the bus, you can also say, oi, slicha, I'm sorry. Lehitraot, see you. It literally means to see each other again. So it's like, to see each other again. Lehitraot. <laughs> uh, it's also very casual. Beseder. Okay. This is a very, very useful word. You can say it when someone asks you, how are you? Beseder. You can say it to show you understand something. When someone gives you direction, you're like, beseder. Uh, it literally means in order, like everything's in order. Tov, fine. And most of the time it means fine. Literally, it means good. A lot like beseder. How are you? Tov, to respond to a direction, like uh, go that way, please. Tov, fine, I understand. Allo daval, you're welcome. We use it as you're welcome, and it literally means, oh, for nothing. Thank you. Oh, a lot of all. It was nothing. It's maybe a bit more formal than bevakasha. Most of the times when people say toda, you answer bevakasha. You can also answer a lot of all. It's pretty much the same, though bevakasha is a bit more common. Boker tov. Good morning. Boker tov, uh, which literally means good morning, and you obviously use it in the morning. Boker tov. Laila tov. Good night. So yeah, good night you can say uh, when you leave a party at night, you know, you can say, okay, bye, good night, Laila tov. Tsohoraim tovim. Good afternoon. Tsohoraim tovim. Good afternoon. You can definitely say that, but you don't hear it that often. It literally means good noon. Ma shimcha? What's your name? For a male, it would be ma shimcha. For a female, ma shmech. What is your name? You can also ask ech uh, koreim lach, which literally means how are you called. And this is the most common way to ask. Naim lehakir. Nice to meet you. Literally, I guess it would mean pleasant. It is pleasant to meet you. And you can say na'im lakir otach for a woman or na'im lakir otcha for a man. A4. Where? A4 hatachana. Where is the station? A4 is very important. You should memorize this one. Ani mevin. I see. For a woman, it would be ani mevina. I understand. I see. אני מבינה. מה השעה? What time is it? The literal translation would be, what is the hour? This is how you ask. סליחה, מה השעה? Excuse me, what time is it? אפשר בבקשה לקבל? Can I please have? אפשר בבקשה לקבל מים? Can I please have some water? And this would be the same uh, for a male speaker and for a female speaker. אפשר בבקשה לקבל? איפה השירותים? Where is the restroom? איפה השירותים? Where is the restroom? שירותים is restroom. איפה השירותים? Another one to memorize. אני מצטער. I am sorry. אני מצטער. Or for a female speaker, אני מצטערת. אני מצטערת להפריע. I am sorry to interrupt. כן. Yes. You can... Use it in any way you used yes. Yeah, use it. Be positive. Lo. No. I like this word. It has a fun sound. And it was my sister's first word. Lo. No. Bali. I feel like. Bali. It's two words. Bali. And it means I feel like I want. And you can also use it as a negative. Bali glida. I feel like ice cream. I want ice cream. Lo bali. I don't feel like going to school. So it's very useful. Children use it a lot, but grown-ups use it too. Die. Enough. Stop. Uh, it sounds really bad, but it's harmless. It means uh, enough or um, stop. When someone is like bugging you, poking you, like, die. Stop it. Enough. Yeah. <laughs> How much is it? Kama ze ole. How much is it? How much does it cost? Meule. Awesome. 
great. I guess maybe the Hebrew equivalent of the word awesome, uh, it's me'ule. The masculine form is me'ule and the feminine is me'ula. Like, ha'ofa'a uh, zot me'ula. This show is awesome, it's great. Ech haya tiyul? Haya me'ule. How was the trip? It was me'ule. Great, awesome. Okay, that's it for today for Top Hebrew Phrases. Thank you so much for watching. And what is your favorite Hebrew phrase? Tell us on the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe. Bye! Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, can you use adjectives as nouns in Hebrew? In Hebrew, it's possible to omit the noun and use its adjective instead. To explain how it's done, let's look at some examples. Let's say you're at a clothing store looking for a new shirt. You've tried on a few and now you need to decide which shirt to buy. Eventually, you decide on a red one. You can tell the salesperson, I'll take the red shirt. But since it's obvious the subject here is the shirt, you can simply say, I'll take the red one. Unlike English, when the word shirt is omitted, it's not replaced by another noun or one. The adjective itself functions as a noun. It's important to note that the adjectives you use has to match the gender of the original noun. The word for shirt in Hebrew, chulza, is feminine. So the adjective red, adom, took its feminine form, aduma. If you were to buy a hat instead of a shirt, you would have to match the adjective to the gender of the masculine word hat, kova, and say adom. Likewise, if you want to refer to an item that has the plural form, like flowers, socks, or glasses, you'll use the plural form for the adjectives, adumim or adumot. Let's put it all in one example. Let's say you run into a friend you haven't seen for a long time and ask how are her four children doing. She gives you a quick update on them. The older son is an actor, the middle daughter goes to university, and the young ones are still in school. If she were to say that in Hebrew, her sentences would have been much shorter, since the subject is her children, and the adjectives explain the gender and the quantity of the nouns. She will not have to say son, daughter, or ones, because all the information is included in the adjectives. Here is the Hebrew sentence. Hagadol sachkan, haemtzeit lomedet ba'universita, v'aktanim adayin bevet sefer. Hebrew adjectives help you keep your sentences short and sweet. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. See you in another lesson. Retrot! Want to speak real Hebrew from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at HebrewPod101.com Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, why is the word panim, face in Hebrew, plural? This question has to do with an interesting phenomenon in the Hebrew language. There are a few nouns in Hebrew which are plural in their grammatical form, but singular conceptually. Sound confusing? Let's break it down. The four main nouns that are singular but plural grammatically are life, chaim, water, maim, and sky, shamaim. In addition to the noun form, this lesson's question, panim. As you can see, all of these words have typical plural masculine endings, im. Grammatically speaking, these words are plural. They don't have a singular form, and the adjectives attached to them will take a plural form as well. Some examples would be chaim arukim, long life, maim chamim, hot water, shamaim meunanim, cloudy sky, panim yafim, or yafot, pretty face. This noun is both feminine and masculine. So why are these words plural? There is no definite answer to this question, but there are a few interesting theories. One of those theories suggests that these words are plural because all of these nouns are constantly changing. Each of them is one noun that actually has many forms and cannot be captured by a singular noun. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Later on. Hi. Welcome to Introduction to Hebrew. My name is Alicia, and I'm joined by... Hi everyone, I'm Edith. In this lesson, you'll learn the basics of Hebrew grammar.
Word order refers to the order in which words are structured to form a sentence in a given language. The first thing you must remember when reading Hebrew is that it's read from right to left. Consider the English sentence, he ate an apple. But first, let's remove the article an here for simplicity. So we're just left with, he ate apple. The basic word order for English is subject, verb, object, or SVO for short. If we break down the English sentence, he ate apple, we can see that the subject he is presented first, followed by the verb ate. And then finally, the object apple is positioned last. This is the basic word order for sentences in English. Now let's compare that same sentence, he ate an apple, in Hebrew. Hu achal tapuach. In Hebrew, you only need an article for definite articles. Here we have only an indefinite article, so we don't need a word like a or an. If we break down the Hebrew sentence, we get the subject, hu, meaning he. Then comes the verb, achal, meaning ate. And finally, we have the object, tapuach, meaning apple. The word order for Hebrew is the same as English, subject, verb, object, or SVO for short. In Hebrew, for simple sentences with a verb, the order is the same as in English. Word order varies in Hebrew for emphasis and in more complicated sentences. You don't have to worry about that until you learn the basics. For now, use the basic subject verb object form when making sentences in Hebrew. Okay, let's move on to the next section. In Hebrew, you want to begin with the subject of your sentence. Let's start with the pronoun I. In Hebrew, that's ani. Next, you need your verb. In the present tense, there are four forms for verbs according to masculine, feminine, masculine plural, and feminine plural. When your subject is I, the verb is conjugated either in masculine or feminine, depending on who is talking. Using the verb to love, le'ehov, as an example, the masculine is ohev, and the feminine is ohevet. So, what do we have so far? I'm a woman, so I would use the feminine. Ani ohevet. The last thing we need is an object, something you love. How about dogs? Klavim. Ani ohevet klavim. I love dogs. If I were a man, I would say, Ani ohev klavim. So it's as simple as that, and very similar to English. Now it's your turn. See if you can use these words to make the sentence, The boy loves dogs. Ohev. Klavim. Hayeled. Did you succeed? First you need the subject, the boy. In the present tense in Hebrew, the verb is determined by the number and gender of the subject. Here we have one boy. Hayeled. Then you need to add the verb, the boy loves. This verb will be conjugated in masculine singular for the boy. That's ohev. Hayeled ohev. Finally, you add the object. Altogether, the boy loves dogs. Hayeled ohev klavim. But what if you're not a dog lover and you want to express that in Hebrew? Forming the negative in Hebrew is very easy. You just need to know one word. Lo. To make the sentence negative, you add this word before the verb. Ani lo ohevet klavim. Great! Now you know how to make a sentence in Hebrew and you know how to say it in the negative. Next, we're going to teach you one more thing. How to ask a question in Hebrew. This is really difficult. Are you ready for this? You don't have to change a word in the sentence. To ask a question in Hebrew, you change how you say the words in the sentence. Let's hear, the boy loves dogs, as a question. Let's hear the difference between the normal sentence and the question. The normal sentence is, The question is, the formal way to ask this as a question is to add a word to the beginning of the sentence. But this way is not used very often in speech. You say ha'im before the rest of the sentence. Ha'im ha'yeled ohev klavim? If you want to ask who loves dogs, you replace the subject with the word for who. That word is mi. Mi ohev klavim? Well done! 
Let's wrap up this lesson by recapping what we've learned. In this lesson, you learned that Hebrew sentences are formed using a subject, verb, object, or SVO word order, just like in English. Secondly, you learned how to make a sentence negative by adding one word before the verb. Lastly, you learned that asking questions in Hebrew is easy because you only have to change the way you say the sentence to ask a question. Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, how do you use the Hebrew preposition al? The Hebrew word al has many uses. It can mean on, about, of, at, or for, depending on the context. Let's go through some examples so you can learn how to use al correctly. First, let's do some examples for when al means on. יש ארנק על השולחן. There is a wallet on the table. התמונה תלויה על הקיר. The picture is hanging on the wall. Here are some examples of the word על when it means about or of. אנחנו צריכים לדבר על זה. We need to talk about this. לא שמעתי על הסרט הזה. I haven't heard of this movie. The word על is also used as at to indicate a direction like in this sentence. Look at that man. It can also be used as for to indicate purpose or consideration. Thank you for the present. He was punished for the crime he committed. The word al can also be conjugated in a few ways depending on the subject it's referring to. These conjugations are created by combining the preposition al with a pronoun such as I or you. These conjugations are needed in case the word al is referring to a person not being mentioned by name. For example, if we said, I'm thinking about him, instead of, I'm thinking about Ben. Likewise, it can also be conjugated for objects without explicitly stating them. For example, the book is on it, instead of, the book is on the shelf. Here are a few examples for conjugations of the word al. Siparti lachalea. I told you about her. Ein mokom al ha-shulchan, yesh alav sfarim. There is no room on the table. It has books on it. Ata yekho l'istekel al ha-reitim, aval al tisha'en alem. Literally, you can look at the furniture, but don't lean on them. Kol ha-kafe nishpach alai. All the coffee was spilled on me. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below, and I'll try to answer them. Hi everybody, Edith here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Hebrew questions. The question for this lesson is, what does the expression al regel achat mean? This expression, meaning literally on one foot, is very common in Hebrew, and many people use it without even knowing its origin. Basically, it's used to describe something that's done offhandedly with no previous thought or preparation. But where did it come from? The origin of this expression, like many other Hebrew expressions, is a story from the Talmud, a central text of Rabbinic Judaism. The story revolves around the great Talmudic sage Hillel, also known as Hillel the Elder, one of the most important figures in Jewish history. Hillel was a famous scholar known for his gentleness and patience. In the Talmud, Hillel is often mentioned together with his colleague Shammai. The two scholars often disagreed on the interpretations of Torah law. While Shammai tended to follow the stricter interpretation, Hillel considered love of men as the core of Jewish teaching. Our story is about a man who wanted to convert to Judaism, but didn't really want to put in the time or effort to do so. This man went to Shammai with one request. He wanted Shammai to teach him the entire Torah while he, the student, was standing on one foot. Shammai was insulted by the man's ridiculous request, since the Torah is deep, profound, and complex and cannot be taught in the short time in which a person can stand on one foot. When Shammai threw him out of the house, the man went to Hillel. He asked him for the same thing. Hillel accepted the challenge and told the man, What is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That's the whole Torah. The rest of the explanation of this, go and study it. The story teaches us the special virtues of Hillel and of the Torah, and it's also the source of the expression, al regel achat, on one foot. Today, you can use this expression when you want to imply that something is done briefly, without much thought behind it. 
For example, if you want to say that an issue is very complicated and cannot be solved easily, you can say, It's a complicated issue. It cannot be resolved on one foot. Or if you just gave someone the short, undetailed version of a complicated matter, you can say, That's the whole story on one foot. You can also find this expression in introductory articles and books that explain complicated issues in an accessible way. Something like Guides for Dummies. For example, the title of an article about economics that tried to simplify the basics of it could be Kalkala al regal achat Economy on one foot. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Later on.